Uh, hi there. I'm Luke. <laughs> and I'm Roger. I don't care who the f you are, mate. Get the f out of my house. <sighs> don't mind him. Okay, people seem to use our dissected series to get advice on writing and creating internet things, and ask for specific things every now and then, so we figured we could do a chapter about general internet creation things. Writing, fan art, animation, whatever. Of course, I'm just some guy, and not particularly successful or popular, or taken for a grand example of success, anyway. But we can talk about some things for starting artists out there, I suppose. So yeah, before okay. you start, think for okay. a moment. Okay. So there's like three different kind of artists in the world, right? You got your dry cleaners. <sighs> this is why I keep telling you not to go to the pub in the night before we do a video. Okay, story time. Way back in 2004 or so, uh, some guy came up to me uh, telling me about some incredible project he was working on. He didn't mention any specifics, but it was amazing and big and he needed tons of people to work on it. So he hired artists and, and, and people and animators like, like me. Now I'm equally very cynical, expecting this thing to be a big joke, but also weirdly positive. As in, hey, I'm just sitting in my room screwing around, might as well tag along with the project and see what happens, you know. So I agreed to assist. Now, there wasn't a concept art or writing or anything yet. It was just a blank website where all the artists could post messages about themselves. So the, the, the organizer told us to do write about everything we did on this project, you know, for our fans! Because the fans want to know how this project is going! And that confused me. Why is he talking about fans while this project is just barely started? I asked if this was a sequel project to a webcomic that I already released or something, but nope. This was the brand new start. And then he wanted me to make a trailer for the website. Like, uh, about what? There's no concept, no art, no characters, nothing. Only you and your dumb face shouting about how amazing this was. Nothing. Yet he wanted to have a trailer. For the fans, because fans need to know what we're doing and we need to get new fans. So what the heck do you want the trailer to be? There's no art, there's nothing. All I knew that the project was vaguely about a superhero or something. Do I just make something up? Or should it be a black screen with just words? Oh my god! Epic! Amazing! Come see! We're making a, a thing! Amazing thing! You gotta see this, this thing we're doing! I could have done that. Hey, you know what? I might have gotten some people to come to this guy's website. Internet people love sarcasm and boastful language and stupid things. But even if I could trick, say, a hundred people to come to his website, then what? They come to a blank site? See us talking about something? And then they get bored and leave again, probably. Okay, so the moral of the story, I guess, is that you all like to daydream about success. When you write your first draft, you already picture yourself interacting with fans and not being like those lame other artists that are grumpy and lock themselves in their room. No, you're going to be awesome. And sure, daydreaming like that is fine. It's motivation. It's, it's like the carrot in front of you while you run on a fret walk. <laughs> My aunt was killed by a carrot runt. <laughs> it made her very cross. What? Uh, anyway, the problem with, with daydreaming is that it can be poisonous. It's like coffee or, or drugs, I guess. It's an enhancement for your brain. It makes you stronger, but it can destroy you if you don't use it properly. Maybe you need coffee to start your morning up. Uh, fine. Then drink that coffee and, and get started. However, if you drink tons of coffee every morning and then you're still too lazy to do anything, you're poisoning your brain to need coffee just to get to the level where you don't do anything. So on the, on the day you do want to work hard in the morning, you'll find that coffee doesn't do a damn thing for you. Same with artwork compliments. Fine, you want people to compliment you and pat you on the back. Hey, nice drawing! Can't wait to see what you're doing! Attention and praise. It's a drugs for artists. But that stuff is hard to get, especially when you start. And it can be poisonous to your brain if you get it too much. So okay, maybe you need some attention to get started. Fine. Go get your attention, but then use it! Do it! Finish! Keep going until it's done and you earn new compliments. They're the fuel for your car. It needs to be self-sustaining. The fuel you got also needs to be used to drive to the next gas station for more fuel. If you can't make it there, you fail as a car. So yeah, we all like to daydream. While drawing, I also imagine that, that I'm sitting at Conan O'Brien's show and everyone is, Oh my god, Roger, I love your amazing new movie! Uh, and I'm like, sure, Shia LaBeouf. I also acknowledge that 
you exists. And he's, hooray! And I, I have this stupid scrap of paper with a dumb drawing on it. And I'm like, look, I made a sketch for my new movie. And millions of people take the bit of paper and start arguing about what new movie will be about. Oh, wow, I think I see a tree. Wow, Roger's new movie will contain trees. Oh my god, it's, it's gonna be the best movie ever. Of course we daydream. It's fine. We need a little. But be careful and don't draw in your dreams or you become depending on the attention. Uh, there's nothing more irritating than an artist that constantly needs attention, constantly asks what you think about every minor improvement, constantly guides people into seeing their work. If you can't get motivated without attention, don't become an artist. But hey, you need feedback, otherwise you don't know if you're doing it right. That's true. It's a weird contradiction. A complicated circle. You want feedback to know if you're doing it right. Sad thing is, good feedback is rare and hard to find, unless you have a very good friend or lucky, but you probably won't get it. Not on the internet at least, and most people don't like it when you ask for it either. Just do your thing. Hope the people who screaming at you how much you suck or should kill yourself are at least nice enough to drop a few hints why they hate it, and do research and think about how much you want to improve. Or just don't give a damn. For as my experience goes, as long as there's some entertainment value, there's always people willing to forgive flaws. My old animations were more awkwardly drawn, worse audio quality and pacing issues than I still have. But hey, at least something dumb and funny happened, so a bunch of people enjoyed it, and tons of people hated it. And I just keep on going and learning a tiny little thing every now and then, and eventually the amount of people who sent you death threats will become less, and people who only mildly hate you will increase. Not to mention, asking feedback is great, but you gotta have something substantial. When you have real worries and questions, you know, specific things, is the timing right, do you understand what's going on, blah blah blah, you know, it's specifics. But too often I'm asked for feedback for something that just I exists. Look, I made this animation, where this thing moves. Tell me if I did it right. Sure moves, well done, mission com complete. But I'm not famous yet and people don't comment on this. Yeah, well, ask yourself a question. You love it because you made it, but if someone else made the same thing, would you care? The internet is not your grandmother, you know? We don't pat you on the back for just being able to do something. There needs to be entertainment value to it. More than just your personal rush of, oh, I'm able to do something. See, the internet is a huge room filled with people who are all bored. Nobody's impressed by you existing in this room. They say something stupid and eventually a bunch of people will come take a look. The thing is, being an artist is often very lonely. Well, it depends on what kind of artist, but, but usually you have to figure things out by yourself. If you want to start a webcomic, or write a story, or create a new hilarious video game show, think about a moment for what kind of person you are. Uh, the Stop touching my binoculars, you c**t! Hey, you? <clears throat> very roughly speaking, I think as far as it comes to performing, to, to creating art, there's two kinds of people in the world. Or at least two directions your mind can be in. Okay, sorry. When I was graduating high school, all the students could write their own little story in a book about their plans in the future and such. And I noticed something when... when the classmates of mine that were always loud in class, the party kids, the kids that ruled the class and always had something to say, barely wrote anything in that part. Only simplistic, dumb things. I'm going to study to become an animal trader, bye! You know, straightforward, normal stuff. While almost all the people I knew that were always quiet and sitting in a corner had enormous and very creative stories, including me. I rarely talk in class, but get me to write a story or push me in front of the class to do a presentation and you can be damn sure I turn it into a whole show. Basically, what I figured is communication and talking is all about getting attention, but, but there's two kinds of attention. You know? There's the machine gun attention, where you just do a lot of dumb, loud, stupid things, and other people react by saying dumb things back. So there's tons of back and forth, and therefore a consistent stream of attention. So essentially, chatty lady people. Non-stop squeaking out every dumb thought that crosses their simplistic minds in a non-stop storm of noise. Or there's the precision sniper attention, the person who sits quietly in the corner and is just thinking, but when he or she finally gets up and says something, it has the impact of a bomb, a completely crazy twist, a brilliant insight, an impossible joke. They're the people who can go for a long time without attention, because non-stop noise is not proper attention. Attention needs to be earned. You need to have this, this special thing to, to do or to say, and get one explosion of attention that gives you enough energy to work on the next clever comment. Those are the two extremes of people. Of course, most people are in the middle, somewhere. So when you become an artist, think for a moment which of the two people you're most like. It can help make you a decision. If you need constant people around you, constant praise, constant verification of about what you're doing, become a blogger, become an organizer and plan meetings, become a voice actor. Those are the professions where you can create a product relatively fast and get relatively easy attention. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying those jobs are easy. 
They do require a lot of talent and skills, but you can complete a project and get some attention relatively fast. Maybe become an internet reviewer, though depending on where you are in the balance, you may want to make the video so that they don't need a lot of editing. You know, do those jobs. But for God's sake, don't pick any of the other artistic directions. Webcomic, more complicated reviews, especially not animation. Those jobs are very lonely, you need to sit still and work quietly for hours. Not, not to mention people expect a high level of comedy or insight or intelligence. Not your dumbass thoughts. These are jobs for people who enjoy sitting in the corner and thinking quietly. So unless you're in the middle, stick with your group. These two kinds of mental thinking don't really mix well together. Ugh, seriously, I've been sharing rooms with several people for several years and I'm constantly grouped with one of those machine gun attention people and I despise and hate them! I I'm like in the kitchen uh, at, at breakfast just sitting and, and thinking about my new editorial or having a new animation play in my head so I can plan the camera shots in advance. And then one of those drooling vegetables comes out and starts blurring every thought they have out. Oh, it's cold. Hey, I'm hungry. I think I eat a sandwich. You ever eat sandwich? Oh, I really like sandwiches. Hey, are you eating? What are you eating? Hey, you're eating. Oh, you're eating a cereal. Oh, I like cereal. Some days I eat cereal too. Cereal is better. Shut up! I'm thinking. I have absolutely no desire to contemplate your inner thoughts. It's because people like that I despise family meeting and social situations. I like to be the storyteller, tell a constructed story. Be the uncle in the chair with a pipe and with a joke and an anecdote ready for every occasion. God, just have one of those machine gun chatter boxes in the room and every attempt at storytelling you try will be obliterated. Trying to work my way up the punchline before those brain dead idiots honor us with their incredible thoughts. Please show me your attention for my incredible skills of being able to acknowledge the basic primitive feelings that everyone has. <clears throat> I'm getting off track. I've seen too many times that a person of the first category wants to become an animator or an angry video game nerd reviewer, and then go mad. Yes, I know, those explosions of attention are very tempting. Who wouldn't want to become the next nostalgia critic and have millions of comments and adoring friends and go to conventions with a cheering crowd? But those things need to be earned, with lots of slow and lonely work. Maybe Doc is swimming in non-stop attention now, but I'm pretty sure his early years were just him sitting quietly in a room editing and looking for things. And he's a rare success story. Maybe you'll never have success and attention. Usually, as long as there's some effort in your work, you will get yourself a small group of followers sooner or later. People like effort and love people getting things done. But you shouldn't require them. There are rewards you get from hard work. Unless you're lucky or have hired some company to give you some PR. Now you'd be super famous in no time, I guess. Uh, I could have been famous, you know. I could have been a contender. But aliens kept kidnapping me. So yeah, before you start, think for a moment about who you are and why you're doing this. If you like attention, if you decide to be part of the cool kids, you better just become a blogger or do simple things. You'll become very unhappy if you try making reviews or animations. Look up an interview of a big animator or a content creator on the net and, and see what they have to say about how they started. Red Letter Media, Doug, Angry Video Game Nerd, whatever, me, if I'm allowed to put myself in that category, I, I guess. We didn't do it because we wanted to become famous, we had an idea, a desire. I became an animator because it's just fun to see your ideas come to life, it gives you a sense of power. For the first year I've been animating, I didn't even put them online and rarely even told anyone around me what I did. It's for my own satisfaction. Hey, yeah, getting the attention now is great. The King of Spain, mm -hmm. right? As the biggest pair of mustache you sure I've ever seen on You know, if you're dreaming about becoming an next nostalgia critic or whatever, here's another thing you gotta keep in mind. I read this book. <laughs> okay, thank you for that look. So, I had this book called Discworld The Truth. It's a book about the creation of the first newspaper in a fantasy world. It has a wonderful ending that really sums up what it's like to be a person like, like Dog or Mr. Plinkett. Okay, so the hero of the story, William the Ward, creates the first newspaper while he's involved in some sort of mystery going on in town. There's some political game being played and a murder committed. So while he's solving the case and goes through the mystery, he's writing all about it in his articles, and the newspaper's selling like mad and he's successful. And eventually the mystery is solved! He discovered the criminal, the plot has thwarted, he's a hero, he has this amazing news story, the end! Run towards the sunset and end credits! Except, no. The next day he wakes up and it's... Okay, where's the next news story? What news story? I saved the day, I solved the mystery, the exciting adventure is completed! Yeah, great. That was a great story in yesterday's paper. But, but now it's Wednesday, where's the news for Wednesday? And Thursday? And Friday? This is no dramatic victory, no heroic ending. After all the hard work and the exhilaration of solving the case, nobody cares anymore after 15 minutes and just want the next newspaper. And the next, and the next, and the next. 
that kind of sums up what it's like. You know, you work on this project, this animation, this review, and you're working for it for hours and drinking coffee and staying up all night, and you're completely into it and emotionally drained after it's finally complete. Your magnum opus, your masterpiece, your... Where's the next Blinket review? That was nice. When's the next episode? Hey, there's another video game you should review. Why don't you do this and this? Where's the next episode? And next and next. You have little time to enjoy your success. Gotta get moving. Gotta get jump straight to the next one. And it better be even better. Really, it's less like being a super genius Leonardo da Vinci artist guy and more like being a drug dealer. Just give me the next buzz. Outside, whenever social obligations force me to spend a day around family or friends, I only permit myself a night for gaming or relaxing on the day I finish a movie. Well, unless I just bought a new game I just really want to play. Other than that, I spend every second of my spare time on my work. These animations don't make themselves, and unlike others, I don't get paid for these, so, so I have to use my spare time to make these. Which I don't mind, I like doing things. In fact, there's only one thing I really hate in life, and that's when I have nothing to do. Being bored and stuck in some social situation where I'm not allow even allowed to daydream or doodle something is my worst nightmare. So, good for me! As I said, I, I make animation for my own pleasure. And getting attention is a nice bonus. But yeah, being successful on the internet requires a steady stream of new material. Nobody wants to follow a webcomic that only has one page every month. And yeah, I can get away with only having one animation done every few weeks, but, but you know, an animation is immediately five minutes worth of material. It doesn't start and end in the middle of the same discussion like a comic page would. But anyway, this is something you have to keep in mind when you become a creator. Even a pathetic, low-level creator like me. Create one thing and just kick back for a couple months and you're out of the internet conscious. And that's fine. I'm at peace with it. After all, it's a job. Without salary. Poor factory workers or kitchen staff or whatever also work their hearts out and need to get back to work the next day. It's life. Uh, just saying, don't expect internet creation to be much more glorious. Sure, there's the special moments when you go to a com or get invited somewhere. I suppose those are the big victories, the special endings. But hey, you don't need to be a creator for those. If you want attention at the con, just become a cosplayer or something. That will give you much more attention than being a third-rate internet whoever anyway. Trust me, my friend wearing a special t-shirt will more often get spoken to on a Sonic convention than I do, despite all the dumb cartoons and stuff. But you know what I always do in this kind of situation? Hmm? Barnevels! Yeah. Didn't think of that, did ya? Hmm. <sighs> <sighs> writers. I have to deal with a lot of writers. When it comes to creating a product, a piece of art, there's three kinds of mindsets required. The creative mind for the idea, the craftsman uh, to turn the idea into a product, and the businessman to provide the material time and release of the product. These three people always hate each other. The writer has amazing epic ideas, but the craftsman is complaining that's too hard to do, and the business guy says it's too expensive. The craftsman wants to do a proper job and create a nice product, but the writer is constantly pushing him out of his comfort zone, and the business guy is giving him horrible cheap material he can't work with, and the business guy tries to desperately create a product with way too little money and time available, while all those idiot writers and craftsmen are always wasting time and money with obsessing over details that nobody outside of their crafts even cares about. You know, they constantly hate each other. I have a weird relation with writers. I suppose technically I'm a writer kind of guy. However, as a content creator, I make animation from start to rush to finish. I'm also partly a craftsman and business person myself. I, I have those mindsets in, somewhere in my brain. So I'm a little bit of all of them, which is practical when you're a one-man team. I don't have to fight with other people, I just have to fight myself. Anyway, it's very frustrating for me to talk with real writers because they never have this balance. Okay, so this happened several times now, at least twice a year, it's not even funny. Some people, sometimes friends, sometimes complete strangers, come to me and ask me my opinion about their little story they wrote. This happened even before I did Sonic Dissected. Though since I do that, that happens even more often. So I'm like, okay, fine, I, I can look to your little chapter, your poem, your fairy tale, your whatever silly little thing you've written, and I'll give you my feedback. Fine, whatever. And then I get this whole freaking seven novel epic thrown in my face. They're, they're writing the new Lord of the Rings, they're writing a whole TV show, and they're all excited. Oh man, my TV show has seven seasons, and, and a movie in between the second and third season. I'm already sending emails to a producer, and I've, I have a list of all the voice actors I want to, to act the, these characters. Sometimes when I'm not careful, I may accidentally ask a polite question about their story, and, in which they respond by throwing five chapters worth of information out of context to me, and... Rah! Look, planning ahead is great, it's fantastic. I love it when a writer knows and plans ahead. It's why I love Harry Potter. So my inner writer is excited for you. 
but my inner craftsman and businessman scream and rage at you. Are you freaking mad? You think you can walk into a studio and demand seven seasons of animated show right out of the gate? Even just Whedon can pull that off. If I went into my animated series IMP with the immediate desire to create a 100 episode story arc, I'd given up on that series a million times already. That show now has over 50 episodes because I make them one at a time, with the occasional free partner. Because of that, not because I want to create a 500 super season epic thing. Planning is great, fantastic. Please, do write your general overview of the story and, and, and create a structure where all the characters fit and where they go. Make yourself a flowchart, fantastic, it's great, good writing. But that's for your own guidance, don't throw it at me because it has no meaning to me. I can judge concepts. This character starts nice and then betrays the hero and turns to a paperclip. Sure, great, go for it. Will it be a success? I don't know. Depends on the context. As far as that's concerned, I'm pretty much the opposite of Doc Walker who loves judging movies just on their concept alone. As far as I'm concerned, every concept has potential, as long as you know what you're doing. And I can't judge that based on the concept. Anyway, for God's sake, if you're serious, if you genuinely want to create a product, if you're really set on calling a producer or a TV show or, or hell, if you just plan on bothering me and asking me to overlook your project, my inner craftsman and businessman beg you, just focus on the first chapter or the first pilot episode. Just them. Forget about the rest. Don't tell me about how amazing chapter 12 will be. Don't tell me about the crazy season finale in episode 17. I don't want to know. You just give me a headache. First chapter, first pilot episode. First part is important, vital and tough. You will have trouble starting, and you will have to rewrite that first chapter several times. Harry Potter's author Rowling said she wrote five entirely different first chapters before settling on the one we got now, I, I think. And that's good. The first chapter is important. And yes, I know. But Roger, the first chapter isn't interesting. The plot twist and the big action scene don't come until chapter 12. Whatever, first chapter. Nobody reads a book and slugs through the boring first chapter just because... Hey, maybe chapter 12 will be good. If you want to become a writer, and you want to impress me, you want to show me you can really tell a good story, then I want to see that first chapter. The boring bit, yes. The boring bits are more important to convince me of your skills than the best part. You know why? Because big plot twists and exciting action scenes are always good, they're always fun. You don't need skills to create those, everyone can do them. In fact, you have to be a complete giant screw up if you ruin them. It, it's the build up, it's the context in which they fit that, that, that make them work, that, that it's, that's important. Write some dialogue, just have your characters introduced and, and go through their daily lives. If you're capable of writing that interestingly, then I have much more faith in you. It's like cooking. Of course you can make a delicious chocolate ice cream thing. But that stuff is always good. Ah, but I was in a restaurant a year ago and what really impressed me was bread they had on the table. Bread, the most boring thing ever. But hey, if you can do something to the bread that make me notice, that makes me excited. Then the real dishes are going to be a real treat. So don't worry about your giant epic story. Sure, plan it out. But darn it, if you're serious, first chapter, first thing, focus on that, write it, rewrite it. And let the people r read that thing, and again and again. If that first chapter is dynamite, it'll create enough momentum that your reader will hang on until they get to that amazing chapter 12 of yours. But Raj, my story is an epic big fantasy war story. How can the first chapter be exciting? The war can't begin until a few chapters end. Here is just exposition. Well, you know what a good trick is to get exposition in a story without attracting too much attention, eh? Use humor. See? Drama requires a lot of build-up and, pay and a payoff. It's an important thing. So if information is given to you in a dramatic way, the audience will pay extra attention to it. Oh, his girlfriend gave him that special necklace? I'm sure he'll need it later on in the story. Hmm. Humour, on the other hand, is this fantastic ability that it works on its own. A joke is funny. A joke is complete. It doesn't require to be an important part later in the story. A joke happens. You smile, and you forget about it. Yet, the information the joke gave you will still linger on in your mind. In fact, the other great John Cleese said it's one of his techniques in writing. In his show, 40 Towers, he always writes it like that when the episode starts. He will, he will write... Uh, Luke? Luke? Uh... I don't know what John Cleese said. I, I assume we tried to make the exposition as funny as possible. Makes sense to me. Harry Potter has this thing where there's constantly little anecdotes and jokes in early chapters which had important plot points hidden within. You didn't notice at first because the joke is just a joke. It sustains itself. But you do remember a good joke and therefore the plot point is also in your head. 
even if your story is not a comedy, you, you can always have little amusing anecdotes. Sure, not naked gun crazy wacky parody jokes, but just little stories, just little cute things. I mean, take Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Nobody will say it's a comedy, it's a horror story, kinda. Sure, it's lighter than, it, than Dickens' usual fare. Anyway, despite the story not being a comedy, if you read it, you'll notice Dickens is constantly being cute in the first chapter. Playing around with language. Jacob Marley was dead as a doornail. Sure, I don't know what doornails have to do with being dead, but hey, he's dead and that's what we call it. Stuff like that. Playing around, having little anecdotes to amuse the readers while the actual story is still building up steam. That's the way to do it. Ah, shite! This bench is trying to eat me! Oh, oh wait, never mind. It's the boots that ate my feet. Uh, indeed, look, I think we talked enough for now. So, hope you enjoyed our random rambling, and hope there are some bits of not useless information in there. And yeah, I can help writers out with advice, but please limit what you throw at me in a small capacity. I swear, there's nothing worse than getting a writer on a Skype that goes shouting on his about the story in hyperspeed for three hours non-stop and expects me to keep up. I have animations to make, you know? Oh well, see you all next time. Hey, Roger. You know what I really think of you? Yeah? You know what I really think of you? Shut up, Luke. I think you are a big... And another topic and dissected. Big... Want to see us dissect more? Send us video games, food, philosophy books, artists, frogs, scientific hypothesis, and your Marvin Laws this address. And we might dissect them in the future, too. Blah. Oh, hang on. Where's me at?